This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Corinne Shadmi. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. That's right. And on this interview episode, I have the pleasure of talking with Karen Shadmi. His new book, Love Addict, came out just recently from Top Shelf. But before we get to that discussion, we want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off cover price. And every month you'll find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials will be at 45% off cover price. Sometimes at 50% off of the cover price. But often you can find discounts that go higher than that. And, and this month there are some good discounts on some of the comics from Corin Shadmi, who Derek is talking to in this episode, including 35% off of Love Addict and 30% off of Mike's Place. That's right. So whether you're looking for Shadmi's books or other comics, you can't go wrong by visiting Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Andy, I had a fun time talking with Corin Shadmi the other day, and, I, and I'm sorry you couldn't join the conversation. I know that we were planning for the both of us to interview Corin, but things just didn't work out with your schedule the other day. Yeah, that's right. Uh, school is starting up soon, and so um, things are getting hectic again, but uh, I do wish I had uh, had the opportunity to get involved in this interview, but you did a good job without me. Yes, but uh, you were there in spirit. <laughs> Thanks. So, but yeah, we had a great time talking about his new book, Love Addict, Confessions of a Serial Dater, but we also talked about some of his earlier comics as well. So let's go ahead and hear what we discussed. Yep, let's do it. I have the pleasure of having Corinne Shadmi on the Comics Alternative. He is the author, most recently, of Love Addict, Confessions of a Serial Dater, which came out the end of July from Top Shelf. Corinne, welcome to the Comics Alternative. Thanks, Derek. Thanks for having me. Um, so this is your first book with Top Shelf, Love Addict, correct? Yes, it is. And, uh, you know, I hate to start off by asking uh, a creator to give me an elevator pitch, but if you were going to frame this for our listeners who may not have read this yet, how would you describe this love act? It's a semi-autobiographical comic about online dating. And that's it. And I'm glad that you now opened the door to the semi-autobiographical part because I wanted to ask that, but not directly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in, in reading Love Addict, I was wondering how much of this is you, how much of this is made up. And I was curious about the mixture of that in this book. Yeah, um, I would say a large part of it is actually true. Um, and a lot of stuff has been shifted around. Um, some stuff ha have has been made more kind of extreme. The character in the book kind of goes in uh, to the deep end more than I did, um, and you know I think that's that's a given when you're doing kind of a semi auto bio where you're just moving things around and making them a little more dramatic just for for the sake of the story. Uh, but a large part of it is actually um, true. Uh, there's a few stories there that I've um, heard from friends uh but most of it is 
um, things that have happened to me. Um, and I was, I was on online uh, dating sites in several periods of my life. And the thing that was kind of interesting to me is how, you know, I think I, I was on the sites uh, around 2007 or 2006. And back then it was kind of taboo and people would rather not mention that they were online dating. And, um, you know, I had a few like kind of not very successful dates um, on, on uh, some other sites. And then you know, most recently, and kind of the period where the book centers on, I was on OkCupid. And that seemed to be the time where um, these these sites have become kind of the norm. And uh, it wasn't taboo anymore. And everybody was on there. And um, but I took a few anecdotes, a few things that happened in, you know, back in the day, and like the earlier uh, online dating experiences and kind of put it in there as well. Now the the online dating site that the protagonist K and and I mean that's all we know of his name, right? The letter K. Yes. Yes. So uh, it, it's not K A Y for those listening. It's actually K a period. But the online dating site that he goes to in frequency is called Lovebug. And the way that you illustrated and described Lovebug in the book Love Addict, I couldn't help but think. Yeah, you know, this is OK Cupid he's writing about. It is OK Cupid, yeah. And even later, I I kind of I don't know if this was subconscious or not, but the colors of the book are very similar to the color scheme of the OK Cupid website. This blue and peach colors. Um, so that was part of it. But yeah, I called it Love Bug because you know OK Cupid is kind of a stupid name. And um, yeah, you're right. It is stupid. <laughs> and and somehow you know there were probably a bunch of sites floating around, and somehow OK Cupid was the one that became the it thing. And then you know people were seriously dating on it, and but the the the, the name was kind of silly. So I wanted like an equally silly name um and i you know i didn't want to call it okay cupid uh, i didn't want them to like get upset at me or anything so you know actually i think love bug would have made a much better name for a dating website than something like an okay cupid mm, really it, it just um, makes y- sense yeah i mean now there's like a billion types of um my my wife's uh, sister is on a bunch of uh, dating sites and there's one called bumble there's one called the league and it seems like that OK Cupid was kind of like the basic, you know, the kind of Neanderthal of online dating. Or I'm sure that actually it's not the Neanderthal match. I think is the first <laughs> one, but um, it's very basic. And now there's all these like weird, almost like um, you know, craft, uh, you know, refined versions of all these these dating sites. And one of them is, you know, you can only, di- you know, I think only referred. By people and you know stuff that's more exclusive, but OkCupid was was a lot more kind of open and anyone could join and it was free. So um. now, have you read Anya Ulenik's Lena Finkel's Magic Barrel? I have not. No, what's huh. that? Oh, okay. It, well, the reason I mention this is because much of that book is based on OkCupid. No, oh, okay. Is it like um is it a graphic novel or a, a fiction fiction book? No, yeah, it's definitely a graphic novel and in fact um Anya Ulenik has has been on the podcast before. I interviewed her when the book came out. Uh she I guess made her name in prose fiction. She is a, a Russian American writer. Her very first graphic novel, this came out, I don't know, about two, a little more than two years ago from Penguin. And again, the title is Lena Finkel's Magic Barrel. And as, as you may guess from the title, it, it references uh, Bernard Malamud's The Magic Barrel. And so it's mm-hmm. about dating, but for the protagonist, Lena Finkel, her magic barrel is the online dating site OkCupid. And she oh. uses the name OkCupid. And so this – is about her experiences online, although her character, Lena Finkel, doesn't date near as many people uh, as, right. as your protagonist, Kay, does in Love Addict. And so in that way, it's very different. I mean, they're, they're different narratives, but they're similar in that both use, in one way or another, OK Cupid as a, as a, as a jumping off point. I have to read it then. Um, yeah, I think that it, for different people, the experiences are very different on the site. And 
But you see this thing that I really wanted to emphasize that I was seeing my friends do and I was doing it to an extent, but like some people, you know, really going on, on um, basically binge dating and going on an insane amount of dates, uh, filling up their calendar with six, seven dates a week, sometimes two dates a night. Um, and it seemed to me like kind of, can you even process that many people? Um, what, you know, what does that do to you that, you, you know, you're, you're going on that many dates? Um, can you even choose anyone after you've seen so many people? So it's all that kind of stuff. This, 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 you know, if, if you look back at dating 15 years ago, no one was, no one was seeing five or six people a week. You know, that was impossible. And now, you know, if you're in a big city and you're good at, you know, um, whatever you're good at, at chatting on the site, you know, you know how to, to work your way through it, then you can have all these dates. And, and, um, and it's just, it's weird psychologically. What does it do to people? And that's part of uh, the question that the book raises too. Yeah. And in fact, that's one of the things I really enjoyed uh, and appreciated about Love Addict in that it, it kind of confounded my expectations. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, when I saw the book Solicited uh, and I saw your cover, and, and the cover I think is, is great because in, in the bottom half you have the head of your protagonist, K, and then in the top half you have a, a little circling of all of the legs of the women that apparently he's been dating. So I guess I was thinking that this was going to be a book about how serial dating can cause problems with all of the women that the protagonist actually goes out with, right? Uh, how he, mm -hmm. he treats them poorly or uh, how he mixes one up with the other. And there's a little bit of that in this book. But to me, you know, one of the, the some of the power in, in this story is the is I guess you emphasizing what this kind of dating experience does to your protagonist and perhaps even more significant what it does with his relationship with other people in his lives who he, whom he's not dating like for instance his roommate uh, who also has a serial dated pro dating problem of his own yeah i mean it really uh, um, um you know the, at some point when you're dating so many people and you bring that you know you bring a girl out to meet your friends and your friends they they can't even keep up anymore. They're like, they don't even want to try and befriend um, this this person because they know that you're just going to switch it up. So, um, so that's, that's a kind of a strange, a strange thing. Um, and, uh, it, and yeah, and I, I mean, and, and something that I, I like bringing up is that there was, um, I think I was reading, I was doing some research about, uh, you know, the online dating, sites and 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 one of the articles had mentioned uh this this um research that was done where they they had two groups and one group got two candy bars and had to taste both of them and then say which you know the level of which one they prefer and how much they enjoyed it and then another group had 25 candy bars and they had to do the same thing and the weird thing was that the group that had 25 candy bars uh, mark that they had enjoyed the the candy a lot less and could not you know was ha they were having a hard time picking and you know and, and I think that I think that humans are not built to you know see that many people and be able to handle um, seeing that you know that that scope of of uh, of perspective mates you know so. Um, that was part of it. And, and yeah, I was seeing it all around me. The other, the other thing is that when you're in a big city, it really never ends. It's like, a, a it's not like, okay, you've, you've exhausted the dating pool. Um, there's, there's so many people here that you can keep on dating and even, you know, some guys that would be a bad dates or vice versa girls that, they could just keep on dating because there's no like, oh, you know, this person, you know, they, they're a terrible, they're, they were terrible. Like there's no reputation. There's no, you can't grade someone. Although maybe there's like a new app where you can grade the people <laughs> you've dated with. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's some of the things that, that were kind of interesting um, for, for me to explore when I was uh, writing and, and drawing the book.
Hmm. Now, you've said that Love Addict is semi-autobiographical. So, I mean, I want to ask you something, but I'm, I don't want you to necessarily throw shade on your own character, I guess. But, um, I mean, do you consider your protagonist K shallow? Yeah, to a sense. I mean, he starts – well, he starts off looking for a relationship. He starts off looking for love, um, and he has always been – in long-term relationships he's not the kind of guy who just hooks up with with girls who just you know goes to the bar and wants that that like one night stand he doesn't want that when the book begins and through the website and his friend who's basically kind of uh the the, they call that type of character in 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 screenwriting the trickster you know the guy (laughs) who kind of lures you in uh, he's been transformed into like this this shallow guy that's just like a, a a game of numbers, you know, like oh how many how many dates have you gone, how many girls have you slept with, you know, and it becomes very and then he starts feeling it. You can start seeing it in the book that he's kind of um, uh, emptying out. Um, so yeah, that's definitely you know I, I really enjoy reading books where the the character goes through some sort of transformation. And I was since there's no there's no real uh, you know arch nemesis or or like uh, someone that goes against him in the book. It's basically he's his own worst enemy in the book. Um, so so yeah, definitely like he turns from someone who's seeking depth and seeking like a meaningful relationship into someone who doesn't know anymore, doesn't know what he wants, is very confused and. Uh, uh, is not used to this, you know, uh, this frequency and this amount of of, of uh, dates and 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 women. Right, and and the, of course the irony here is that his success at dating, in, I guess you could say, goes to his head and makes him a much less of a person than he was at the beginning. Um, you know, it, at least as we get into the narrative. So it's the it's the shallowness that he grows into uh, and eventually learns about, and he gets to see a part of himself as well, and, and you know, that unattractive side. Uh, but he's someone who, who doesn't seem to start off that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I wanted to, to do this. I wanted him to, you know, when you read the book, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, tell too much about the, the plot or anything, but... It, the first date, it's almost like a glimpse. He goes on with this very awful woman who's just very mean to him and very jaded. And it's almost a gl- like a glimpse to his own future. You know, she's already like come out the other end. She's, you know, jaded and, and, and um, has given up and is just going through the motions and going on more dates. And, um, and he's just horrified. But, you know, when, when, Later, he starts going on that own path. He can't. He can't even see it. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons why I used the word shallow a little while ago is because of one of the creators who writes a blurb for your book, Joe Matt, one of my favorites. <laughs> and you know, when when I was reading Love Addict and knowing that Matt had written uh, an endorsement for the book, I couldn't help but think, okay, this is the kind of character, this is the kind of story that is perfect for Joe Matt. And I'm wondering if you're if if what the his peep show uh in his uh, autobiographic comics that kind of character definitely on the shallow side if uh, you're a fan of his work and if that influenced your decision to do something like love addict uh yeah i love i love his work uh i think there's you know a lot of honesty in it and um you know you're we're surrounded it, with so much uh fakeness in culture right now and so much uh you know um just things that are not sincere you know there's a lot of pretending on television on uh even if you look at politics there's just a lot of insincerity and people just even if they're not lying they're like really embellishing themselves to look better and Joe Matt you know he does the opposite if anything he just you know lets it all hang and just shows the world that this is who I am. doesn't apologize. Um, kind of like crumb a little bit. Um, but I definitely, you know, there's, I, th- I still think that it's, it's a different, it's definitely, there, there are Joe Matt kind of vibes in the book, <laughs> but I think that it's, 
it's definitely like a different um it doesn't sink quite as much into this this level of 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 uh you know a pity party or just uh just um you know almost like the self like trying to reach the highest level of self deprecating humor um which i think he he really does um sometimes um this wasn't really my my goal in the book but i definitely yeah i definitely appreciate his work and i'm so happy he gave me the blurb the blurb that is on the back of the book is actually the censored version uh the full version i think had something in the end along the lines of um uh he is um an uh a, a great failure to the wonderful institution of masturbation <laughs> something <laughs> like that which was ext- extremely funny but uh we decided you know we can't put that in the back of the book but you know <laughs> too bad um, yeah he apparently that was his uh not enough, uh, not enough uh, masturbation scenes in the book, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it, it, yeah, the the thing that I love as well about Joe Matt's comics is that you know he he doesn't put on any pretense, and you know he shows you who he is and what he is, whether you're going to appreciate that or not. And another aspect of that is it leaves you uncomfortable reading about what he goes through, but that's part of the process. And so in that way, reading uh, Peep Show. Remind, reminds me of the experience at times of watching, let's say, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Right. Because uh, I think that Larry David is another kind of artist figure who does the same thing. He puts it out there and makes you feel uncomfortable about it and even makes you feel uncomfortable liking what his character goes through. Right. Yeah. Um, so you're right. There's not at, near as much discomfort in, in Love Addict, but, you know, but there are those parts where you start to turn against the protagonist, which, which, you know, seems to be baked into your narrative. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta make them suffer. You gotta, you know, I think it was, uh, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, uh, or Vonnegut, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but, uh, he said that, you know, whenever you think you've put your main character or your characters through too much, then you have to put them through more. You have to just really torture them and, and take them down some sort of, uh, I mean, not everybody has, but um, I think it, it really is important uh, to, to kind of have the, 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 the world maybe at some point or the character itself turn, turn against itself or, you know, the, whatever the situation around them uh, just makes for better drama and um, and a more more interesting narrative. I think. Mm-hmm. Now, this book has been out for what about three weeks? Almost three weeks now. Uh, what mm-hmm. kind of response has it gotten? Let's say from the reading community is large from. Uh, at large, like reviewers and whatnot, and then maybe even specifically uh, from readers who may be attuned to, let's say, online dating and that phenomena. Um, there has, you know, there hasn't been anything out of the ordinary. Like no one really, you know, no one really got really angry, you know, that about the book being. Uh, misogynistic or anything like that, which I was a little, I thought maybe, oh, I was worried that that would happen. Although it, it is like a male point of view. Um, and, and I'm sure that if it was, if it was written by, if this book was written by a woman, we would have like this other totally um, different experience. Then again, like things kind of, there are experiences that happen to anyone during online dating um, that are regardless if you're a, if you're a guy or a girl, you know, for instance, the person who puts in a picture from high school and then you meet them and they're, you know, are lying about their age and people do that regardless of gender. Um, and yeah, I mean, the response has been so, so far positive. It's still going through the, um, I don't know how you call it, but like still kind of, uh, they just send it out, the publisher, because they were in Comic Con, they just sent it out to um, last week, I think, to a bunch of of uh, reviewers and magazines and uh, and blogs. So we'll see. I think I think there'll be more more to come, and we'll see what happens then. Yeah, you know. In fact, I had wondered about the misogyny charge uh, as I was reading this, wondering if uh, certain reviewers or 
uh, you know, some readers may think that that was a little too much. But, you know, you, you're you right in pointing out that it is told in from you know, the way things are set up here. It has to be told from a male point of view. And so I guess those attitudes that could come across to some readers as misogynistic, um, again, it's kind of part of what you're doing here. And to me, I see this more with not so much Kay as with his friends who kind of ag him on. You know, you talked about his roommate as being the trickster figure. I mean, he's one of them, but there's the other friend as well, and I can't remember his name, um, who also wears glasses. And and the the way that they talk about their conquests, I think, is is something that seems to seep into Kay and influence him to make him the more shallow character that he – turns into and then perhaps migrates out of. Uh, I'll leave it up to the reader to decide on their own. But, um, I mean, so you haven't um, seen any charges of male-centeredness, let's say? Um, Not so much. Uh, Not really. Um, I think that that people understand that this is just, you, you know, this is not reality, but it it, ref, it reflects reality, and it could happen no matter if it's you know there are there are and it's mentioned in the book there are girls out there um, who are the same way they are just um, you know binge dating uh, they're in control they you know can't stop it's the same thing you know there's there's people out there who are who are using no no matter of gender. So I really I was hoping that both uh, both um, types of uh, you know both genders could can enjoy it. Um, and uh, it was funny because when I was uh, the book came out in France first, and I was doing signings there, and I noticed that the main readership for the book was fifty or fifty something year old men. Uh, who were like mostly buying the book and kind of asking me to to draw sometimes uh, uh, very weird things in the book because in France you're <laughs> supposed to to do a drawing. Uh, but then I was in Italy. The book came out in Italy, and it was mostly young women who were reading it. So I don't know if it was just like happenstance or or whatnot. But um, I really hope that everybody you know, can, can enjoy it. And also I think that there's some people out there that are just curious about how, what is this whole thing about? You know, they're, they're married or they've never done it. Um, and I think it's a good kind of insight or kind of, um, maybe also a warning, uh, well, you know, kind of a warning, uh, don't do, don't, don't let it, don't let it get the best of you, but yeah. Hmm. Now, the kind of story you tell in Love Addict, Confessions of a Serial Dater, is quite a bit different from some of your very early stories collected in In the Flesh, which is your first book. Uh, This came out in 2009, but in going back and looking through In the Flesh again after having read Love Addict, the one story in there that I guess connected with it in some way, at least for me, was What is Wrong with Me? Mm-hmm. Uh, because here, I mean, it's a very short, short story, and it's quite funny. You have uh, two people who they're at the end of their date. One goes, the guy goes his way, uh, the woman goes her way, and the man is thinking about the date, how he came across, does she like him? So, in other words, he's overthinking things. He's agonizing over the effect that he had on her, and then we see the woman who goes about her life. Just uh, flittering here and there, watching TV, opening a book, eating a little food, not even thinking about the date. And so there's a series of cross cuts between these two characters, which is quite humorous, right? And I think one could read that story and say, okay, this is you know how men and women deal with relationships in different way. I don't necessarily think that the genderedness is embedded in that story. I think it's just two people thinking of relationships in different way, and that's right. both the tragedy and also the comedy of, of, of that uh, premise. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I mean that that one that story was definitely root, rooted in a real uh, kind of date where where I went out with this with this girl and and afterwards I was just um, 
really obsessing over how did it go? Like, did I do okay? And, you know, she was supposed to maybe call me back or text me and that, you know, never happened. And then, you know, a day later I call her and she's like, what, who's this? You know, just totally. (laughs) uh, And you got the sense that uh, I've been in, I've been inside my head in this like weird hell agonizing over this, this date is it going to lead to anything. Does she like me? Does it? And she's just been, you know, just drifting and just doing her stuff and whatever. That's another, you know, for me, it was this, this very special thing that I was very obsessing, you know, obsessing over. And, and for her, it was just, you know, another day. Um, and, uh, and that's normal, you know, like also you, you, when, when you do go on online date dating, you know, when you do do online dating, you encounter, a lot of times naturally that one person is interested and the other person isn't interested. And it's just, that's, that's in the essence, that's also just part of it. Um, it's just like, you know, you might look good to someone in the pictures, but then, um, when you go on the date and, you know, they see your profile or whatever, um, it just, you know, goes to hell from there. So, um, well, let's talk a bit about the stories in In the Flesh, because this is some of your early work, and this is a collection of stories that are not really connected one to the other. They're, sh- they're short bits, but, but they're much more experimental in nature than we find in some of your other comics. Yeah, um, I, those were a lot of those stories were uh, done when I was uh, still in, in SVA in school, school of visual arts. And I think when you're in school, you're, you're kind of encouraged to, to kind of take the experimental, um, path. Um, you know, those are four years of your life that you, you know, you're not being called by clients to do jobs and you can basically try and and push the envelope. Um, and it's not good to be too, you know, um, uh, conservative when you're, when you're at school, but, um, yeah, I was really trying something different with each with each story and the other thing was that at the time I was watching a lot of these these new wave and mid-century uh story uh movies uh from from Europe. I was watching a lot of Bergman and a lot of uh, Fellini and and uh um and I think that like black and white European European noir uh, feeling is also kind of a little bit in there. Um, there was a story I think that ends in the flesh where it's it's a narrative that's completely disconnected from the images that you're seeing um, about a. I think it's about a dinner party, and you're just seeing these bizarre images of of a woman running through this this uh, giant mansion. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I think this was maybe the most uh, experimental, a lavish um, affair. Yeah, uh, the most experimental story in there, and uh, and then a year later, a few years later, I saw this uh, movie called Last Year in Marion Bed, and I was like, "This is the same. This is uh, crazy that I've never seen this movie because it's so similar to that to that uh, story." And really, in, in in that period of time, you see a lot of these very experimental, um, you know, sometimes surreal surreal movies or um, just kind of, uh, movies that, that, that push the envelope. Um, uh, and I don't know if it's, I think it um, might also have to do with kind of the, 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 the films that came out after world war two, where everybody, yeah, like the whole world was having an existential crisis and that made for like very dark, you know, kind of, um, fragmented, movies and that really really influenced me um and kind of created these these maybe um more um edgy and and strange stories yeah you know now that you mention it uh the stories in in the flesh do have this kind of mid-century european angst laden uh, film quality to them, uh, European films, uh, b- throw in a twist of the Twilight Zone, though. Uh, and you definitely have uh, the tone of In the Flesh. Yeah, th- this is really funny. That's another thing, because um, uh, I was about to mention the Twilight Zone, because 
I actually grew up. I grew up in Israel, and uh, we had the the second uh, Twilight Zone TV sh- series, but the first one was never syndicated or shown on TV in Israel. And then a few years ago, after um, writing in the flesh, uh, I think all of them became available on Netflix, and I watched them, and I was just totally awestruck. I was just, I just couldn't believe that. Um, this existed and I've never seen that um, uh, because just uh, the, just the strangeness of it all. And also the same kind of um, mid century cold war uh, anxiety atmosphere. Um, It's kind of amazing that these, 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 uh, this TV show existed on primetime TV. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, It's, it's pretty dark. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, yeah, there are those, I guess, very experimental stories in in the flesh. You know, you've mentioned a lavish affair. Uh, two that really stood out for me that are really strange are Antoinette and then Grandpa Minolta. <laughs> those are strange. But then you get to one like Pastry Paradise, and even though it's strange, it's not that. I mean, it's it's not unrealistic, and it strikes me that Pastry Paradise would make a great Twilight Zone script. Yeah, I mean, there's really nothing uh, that couldn't happen in that uh, story. Um, and uh, I think I think that one was also, it was very kind of Freudian, you know, food and sexuality and, and um, replacing one thing with another. And again, like you have there this character that goes through this, this transformation from this, this kind of, you know, nerdy girl that's obsessed with school to this 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 kind of plump voluptuous uh woman that's just totally obsessed with with pastries um so uh yeah they, they could uh, I, yeah i guess it could possibly be a twilight zone episode I, the other one i think about is the um, radioactive girlfriend where oh yeah you know there's the the atomic bomb and you know she's she, the the girl becomes a uh, um, you know, radioactive and starts basically uh, killing, you know, passively killing the her her boyfriend um, with radiation. While she gains so, strength. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's it's really I, I, what I like to do, and um, I hope to be able to do that again in the in the future. Is kind of mix together two different genres um, and kind of explore. The when does one thing turn into another? Um, if you look at, for instance, uh, I don't want to segue too early to the Abaddon, but the Abaddon is a little bit like that. Um, we don't really know if this is a horror, if this is a drama, um, if this is, you know, it doesn't really fall into one specific category because it kind of mixes in um, a few genres. And I think that that kind of... Uh, um, that border between two genres is, a, is something really fun that um, hasn't been explored too much. You know, you, you brought up uh, the Abaddon. Now, the Abaddon, not as long as Love Attic, but it's still a longer story. And then the, you know, we were talking about the short pieces in in the flesh. Do you? At, at this point in your career, are you finding it more satisfying to work on longer? narratives or maybe shorter pieces or just depending on the mood and context both can go either way uh it, it comes down to one thing basically that um for some reason or another uh publishers and readers don't you know don't have that much interest in short stories and short stories don't you know, they just don't, they are less likely to get picked up to be published. Um, and I, I love doing short stories, but, um, it's just, there's something about like the big narrative and the one anchor story, the one, anchor, like, you know, the main concept, uh, having like one big concept that helps someone get involved in, in a book and maybe buy it and read it and, uh, same goes for the publisher that, you know, you give them that one line concept and that helps them understand, okay, this is what this book is about. But well, if you're dealing with short stories, there's a bunch of different short 
stories that go in different directions. I mean, In the Flesh was all about relationships. Um, so it did have like one big uh, tenth um, concept, but at the same time, each story went in a different direction. So I think it's partially practical um, that I do want my, my books to be published and I want people to read them. And, um, and you know, if, if I... I keep doing short stories. I'm going to have, it's going to be more of a struggle to get, to get it uh, seen and to get people to, to notice it. Mm. Now, another difference between uh, the Abaddon and the other books that we've been discussing is the fact that the Abaddon began as a web comic. So, mm-hmm. uh, and in fact, uh, a good part of that is still available online at abaddoncomic.com if our listeners want to check that out. Uh, but this was later published in uh, a book form by Z2. Uh, in fact, uh, it was, was it early? It was earlier this year, right? This came out? Uh, I think maybe late 2015. Oh, late, 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 yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. November 2015. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. It took a while to, to kind of jump from the web comic to being published. Um, uh, but yeah, it was an experiment basically for me to, to try posting a comic online, um, see what the reaction is. Um, it was very strange. I've never had a web comic before and I opened it up to comments as most people do in web comics and mostly it was very, you know, people were being very positive, but every once in a while, like you, you know, for instance, there was a scene where the character gets stabbed and the, the date, you know, it was updated twice a week. And uh, let's say the character got stabbed on a Monday and on a Thursday, I had a, basically a black page posted and someone got very angry. They were like, great. I waited all this time for nothing and just got very upset. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I'm giving you this for free. You know, so, um, and the other thing that was funny is that there were people who were like really kind of into scrutinizing and looking for mistakes. You know, there was some page where I drew the character and he was holding, you know, holding a key or something. And his, the back of his arm was, I forgot to draw the back of his arm or something like that. And someone was like, the back of the arm is missing in that frame. And I'm just like, wow, you're just going through this comic, just looking for, you know, tiny mistakes to point out to me. Um, but, but overall, it was good. It's almost like uh, I was talking to someone about it, that it's almost a webcomic. It's almost like a beta test for the story where you actually can still, you know, make some changes before you send it off to, to be printed. And I actually, you know, had a few small revisions done to the book before it was um actually uh printed so uh that's that's a nice element to it and um and the other thing is 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 uh is that it basically puts pressure on you to keep manufacturing more creating more pages and i knew that every i had to post something new every twice a week and it just kept kept me going you know regardless now, did you go into the Abaddon knowing that this would eventually turn into a print hard copy comic and that you were using the webcomic, uh, as you put it, almost as a, as a beta version to test things out and to, to see what kind of reaction you would get? Or did you just want to do a webcomic with no original intention of this seeing print? I definitely was hoping for it to be um – printed and uh, it it originally actually came out in in France which is is funny it came out maybe a year after the webcomic was done uh in France and then um most recently a few months ago it came out in Italy so it's kind of like slowly coming out in different places uh but there there is still something very satisfying about having a physical copy of the book and also I think people still enjoy reading physical comics. You know, you have comicsology and you have all this stuff, but, um, but people still, I think, I mean, I don't know the numbers, but I think that mostly they read the physical comics, right? Still more than, than the digital ones. 
Um, that's what I would guess. I, I don't think that companies like Comixology and other digital outlets provide the kind of information that we would need in order to make that comparison. Um, okay. I'd be I'd be curious to see what those kind of sales numbers are. I mean, my sense of things and again is just anecdotally is that even though many people and more and more people are reading their comics digitally. You still can't be a hard copy version. And my personal feeling is, yeah, digital copies can be much more convenient, especially if you're reading on the go often. But nothing beats having the hard copy of the book in your hand, especially as a comics critic reviewer doing a podcast. It's much easier for me to have a hard copy book in my hand flipping between pages than it is to have a PDF up on a computer, which I'm also right. using for multiple purposes to record the podcast and having okay. to scroll up and down. Yeah, I mean, it, definitely. I mean, there's also some books that you just get and you understand that it's a different experience having an um you know, I just read um, Patience by Dan Klaus, and that book is just, you know, it's like an object, and I think, uh, like an art object, and I think some some creators are really aware of of that kind of physical quality um, of the book, and um, and and I think it's really important. I think, and and I'm I'm happy to see that people are not haven't totally thrown away all their physical books and are still still reading hard copies um it's i think it's a good thing oh yeah in fact i was talking to my class just earlier this week about the experience of reading digital versus hard copy and i used as kind of an obvious but nonetheless you know do, you know very illustrative example chris wears building stories uh, I guess you know one could read that completely digitally. If I don't, I don't even know if it is completely. It would be available very digitally. difficult. But it would it would be a whole different experience, right? I mean, so yeah. you could do it, but it would not be in any way the same kind of reading experience of the actual package. I don't want to call it a book of building stories, and you know maybe not as obvious example is something like um, Ben Catcher's Hand Drying in America, which came out in I guess about three years ago. Uh, and I mention that it's because I mean that is a quite a big book, and I was aware of reading it almost the entire time that I was reading it because I had to hold this large thing up in my hands, either that uh -huh. or set it on the table. But, but but I don't mean that in a negative sense, right? So its materiality, uh, my awareness of it as a physical object, uh, was definitely in the forefront of my mind, and I think that's part of the reading experience that he wanted you to have. Just as right, with uh, Chris Ware, it's the same thing with building stories. Right, it changes. It's it changes the your mood and and um you know the total experience as you as you read it. Um, I think sometimes it's a it's a, it's a little impractical, but um, in the case of of Chris Ware, really as someone who's playing with with those um, with those uh, everything he can, basically pushing the envelope on on everything. Um, I know that uh, when when we published the Abaddon. Uh, with Z2, uh, there was a little bit of concern about the format because it's a wide horizontal format that right. I in initially did because it fit better in, well, reading it online. You know, that's just, I thought, well, all screens online are wide. Um, it would look better. It'd be easier for you to read the whole page that way. Um, but when you come to printing the book, there's some bookstores that don't like stocking books that are horizontal uh, and kind of pop out of the um, the bookshelf like that. So, um, so yeah, there's like the practical, always like the practical concern about it. And um, uh, but I think it, 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 at the end of the day, if it's something really good, it's still going to draw people in. Like Chris Ware's books are a lot of them are horizontal and. Um, and they still, you know, people still buy them and, and enjoy them. And uh, I don't think it, it affects that much um, uh, his success. Now, would you consider starting off webcomic format again with another project? Uh, actually, uh, it's funny you mentioned that. I do have a project now that I started with um, uh, Terraform, which is kind of a... a mini site within motherboard um i don't know if you've heard of, of motherboard but uh it's kind of a tech tech website 
And uh, Terraform is a science fiction site that um, has new fiction every week, short stories mostly. And we just started uh, a web series, a web comic that ideally will be updated once a month. And it's almost like a, a TV show where you have an episode, but instead of a week, a, a month. Um, and uh, they're on the longish side. You know, the, the one I'm working on now is going to be about 20 pages. So it's almost like a comic book issue. Um, is this Afterglow? Yeah, it's called the, – the story the, – the, the story is called, uh, or the series is called The Highwayman, mm-hmm. and um, each episode has a different name. So the second episode is called Afterglow, but the name of the series is, is Highwayman. Okay, um, so, and, and how long has this been going on for? Because I see that, I guess, Afterglow is the second episode? Second episode. Yeah, yeah uh, it just started um, maybe uh, six weeks ago or so, um, and... Uh, it's going to be, I think, about seven seven or eight episodes. So it's not going to be something that's as massive as Love Addict or, or Abaddon, but um, it, it is, it is a, kind of a type of webcomic. Um, and uh, it's, it's been really fun working on it because it's, it's straight up science fiction and it's something that I haven't done in a long time and uh, I enjoy science fiction Um uh, and I think, you know, it's, it is science fiction, but it touches, uh, over a lot of subjects that are, um, you know, very relevant now, like, um, global warming and, and, um, climate change and, and uh, the future of, of, you know, the planet and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's definitely like an undertone of it. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, would, suggest reading it because there's not a lot like there's a lot of uh things un- unsaid and and you could kind of don't know a lot about the main character so so it's kind of good to 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 just read it and and uh and see for yourself um rather than be telling you um about the character uh but yeah it's free to read so yeah and do you have plans on publishing this in book form later on when it's done uh yeah i hope so um it's already, uh, I guess my French publisher is already, she's already mentioned that she wants to publish it. So uh, there's one place that it's going to be published. But yeah, I'm hoping it can be collected to to a book that will probably be around 120 or something like that pages. Hmm. You know, now you've mentioned in the course of our conversation, your, I guess, maybe globetrotting, you know, being in France, being in Italy, having publishers in different countries. Uh, and, and you are Israeli, correct? Yes. So, I mean, I guess one could call you much more international than many of the creators that we have for interviews on the Comics Alternative. Uh, now, I know that your book from last year, Mike's Place, was based uh, – the story set in, was set in Israel. Um, and you're an Israeli artist, or at least you were, you know, you were, you were born uh, in, in Israel. Do you consider yourself uh, a, an Israeli cartoonist or an Israeli comics artist? Uh, that's a good question. Whatever that might I, mean. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think so. You know, I've been here for, you know, I came here right after I was done with my army service when I was, uh, 22, I think, um, 21 or 22. So I've been here for, for, uh, 14 years now. And I feel like I'm, you know, been pretty am- Americanized, but, um, I, I don't really see myself as like uh, an Israeli cartoonist because uh, I'm not really usually that interested in emphasizing like the that you know some people some people really like to to use the fact their their origin story and nationality to kind of um, amp up interest in their work uh, which is fine uh, but I just don't think that's not one of the things that are interesting to me so much uh dealing with with uh, stories that have to do with israel i'm much more interested in things that are more um you know personal and uh um universal um and if you look at my drawing style either i mean if you if you look at 
any any like Israeli cartoonist too. It's like there's really no Israeli style, um, and and my work, you know, could be more looks more similar, I would say, to like European and French comics than it would to um, to anything else. So uh, so yeah, it's it's there's no the, there's no history. The other thing in Israel is there's really no history of comics. There's there is a there's a very kind of meager history of people here and there doing it, but it's not like uh, the French that grew up reading Tintin and or um, you know Americans that grew up reading Captain America. There's no um, pantheon of of these um, these like important characters and historically important creators, and that just doesn't. There's nothing to draw on. From the past, so as someone who's coming from Israel, I draw on from from things I love from other countries, um, uh, like you know French creators or American creators and whoever it is, um, you know, like a variety of people. So you feel that um, there's no in in trying to put your finger on Israeli comics that it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to do so because of a lack of history, because of a lack of a consistency in form or theme? Yes, definitely. I mean, if you look at a lot of the um, – if you, if you even look at the, the spectrum of American comics, you could say the same thing. There's no such thing as like – you know, you have – Gilbert Hernandez on one side and you have Jim Lee on the other side and there's nothing in common, you know, maybe there's a few things in common, but like, you know, you you have Kaz and then you have, <laughs> you know, Rob Leefield on the other end, you know, it's like, you can't really, there's just so much in there, but yeah, there are the staples. At least you do have those staples that you can say, well, you know, uh, golden age Batman and, you know, that kind of Jack stuff. Jack Kirby, and you know, that's an Jack American. Jack Kirby. Yeah. yeah. That's a very American and very influential. And in Europe, you can say, you know, Hergé and, uh, in, in Japan, you could say, you know, Otomo or whoever, um, is, is like, um, I forgot the, the guy who did Buddha. Um, Tama Tezuka. Yeah. Tama Tezuka. Um, so there are these like kind of arch figures, um, but not really, not really in American, yeah. com in, uh, sorry, in, in Israeli comics, there's, it's, it's a young country and we're too busy, like fighting, uh, <laughs> uh to, to draw comics, I yeah. guess. And, you know, one of the reasons why I asked that is because, I mean, I see a lot of complications and, and problems with those kind of designations, right? Just because you hail from a particular nation yeah. or region or ethnic community, does that necessarily make you an Israeli creator or an African-American creator or a Jewish creator or what have you, right? Um, so I, I was wondering if you, um, you know, not only how you may see yourself, but how your readers may perhaps pigeonhole you, knowing that you're from Israel. Because I have to say, in reading through your comics, if I did not know that you were from Israel, I wouldn't have known one way or another where you were from. Right. I think that's a good thing, uh, personally. But people still put the biographical element on it. Like, for instance, in the Abaddon, there's um, scenes that are in the army, and it's supposed to be the American, you know, the Marines or something like that. And people were like, oh, that's the Israeli army. And I'm yeah. Like, well, it's not, it wasn't supposed to be. And then a friend of mine told me there's like a drill sergeant who's a woman in one of the scenes, and he's saying, well, you know, that's really rare in, Amer in the American uh, army have a, a female drill sergeant and maybe that's why people thought that and but but yeah people superimpose their whatever their um you know knowledge of you uh your ethnicity and your origins onto your comics and uh, there are definitely i think elements that you could say have to do with the place i come from and uh you know this kind of existential anxiety and uh, not so much in, uh, I mean, in, in, in Love Addict, it's more of a general kind of, uh, you know, anxiety, but in some of the other stories, you really have this kind of looming doom and, and existential anxiety. And, uh, and maybe that's why I connect to that, that stuff that, you know, all that mid-century, um, 
um, culture that um, had to do with existing in the fear of, of a looming world catastrophe. And, and in Israel, you really, you, you know, everybody acts like nothing, everything's fine. But at the same time, you know, you're, there's all these like numerous ticking time bombs around you. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I think it does that maybe that, that element of it does exist in my work and, and you can be like, Oh, that's the, that's the existential doom guy, you know, <laughs> that's Karen shot me. Uh, okay. So coming back to uh, love addict now, you know, as you've mentioned, this is semi-autobiographical. Do you like working in a more autobiographical form? Or maybe another way of, of asking this question is, do you see yourself writing in any kind of autobiographical way, semi or otherwise, in the years to come? I'm not ruling it out. I mean, it was a lot of fun. There's like something about it that is almost kind of... Um, it, it, you know, it's fun because you're, you're, you're mining your own memories and, and, um, and, and, you know, they say, write about what you know, and, and that's something that you definitely, you know, it's your own experiences in a sense. So, um, it comes in, it comes more natural, naturally, it's less, less of a struggle than, than a totally fictional, fictional story. So, I mean, I enjoy doing both, but, um, I, I don't know what what the future holds. I mean, right now there's Highway Man, which is 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 totally fictional. So, um, so Highway Man, you're currently working on now. Do you have any projects in mind for the future, or anything that you're wanting to soon start on? Yeah, there's actually there's something that I'm also kind of uh, wrapping up right now, but it probably won't come out till later next year. And it's um, a book that I'm I'm working on with a writer, um, and it's uh, the autobiography. Not uh, sorry, not autobiography. I'm getting all <laughs> confused, but it's um, a graphic biography of uh, Gary Gyax, who's the creator of Dungeons and Dragons, um, oh. and the uh, the book is based on uh, pretty uh, pretty well received article by um, Dave Kushner, who wrote it for um, Wired magazine, and it was the last major interview, I believe, with uh, Guy Ax. And um, it's just an interesting story. It's like uh, I played D and D when I was a teenager, and um, I never really knew too much about the guy who created it and like the story of how he was born and his, his life. And so, so it's a really fun, um, comic and, um, it's, a, it's going to come, come out probably later next year from nation books. Wow. You know, the thing about that is you already have baked into that project, very dedicated readers, uh, or potential readers. Right. Because not only right. you know, the comics, but especially the gamer community, they're going to love that. Yeah, I'm, we're really hoping uh, because it's also it's not just someone who's writing a a, a random biography. It's a, it's someone who there's actual interviews uh, with Guy Ax inside the book. Um, you know, the the book is kind of structured um, around uh, these interviews. Um, so it's a personal account. It's like you you know it's all it's basically like you're having. Uh, a D and D game with Gary Gyax, so um, which is what the author did. You know, he he was invited to a afternoon um, game with him, and and um, so yeah, it's it's definitely we're hoping that that uh, that the gaming D and D crossover D and D comics people will will take interest in it. Mm. So uh, we've got that to look forward to. Love Addict, uh, Confessions of a Serial Dater, came out uh, late last month, and you're currently working on Highwaymen, which people can find at the Motherboard site. So, right. um, yeah, you got a lot going on. you got a lot in the future. And so I do appreciate you taking the time and talking with me on the Comics Alternative. So, Corinne, thanks a lot for being on the show. Yeah, thanks so much. That was fun. I, I regret now not being able to be involved in that. 
Yeah, yeah, it would have been great for you to be a part of that conversation, but uh, uh, Corin said he understood. But we did have a good time talking about the new book, Love Addict, as well as his experiences with online dating and uh, – uh, and everything that went into the creation of that book. So it was right. fun. Thank you again, Corin, for being on the Comics Alternative. Come back again in the future. And if mm-hmm. you want to find great books at great discounts, such as uh, Corin's Love Addict, then definitely check out the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. If you go to dcbservice.com, you will not be disappointed at the number of deep discounts you will find. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you think about our conversation with Corin. If you go to the website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message through SpeakPipe, which is really easy to use. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. That's right. Uh, or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com. Or you can get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And we have our Twitter feed where we announce new content to the podcast and updates to the blog. You can check out the Twitter feed at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. You can also find us on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google Plus, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn. You can also listen to the podcast via Spotify. And if you're an Android user, Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our episodes, as well as the written reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us and let us know how we're doing. That's right. So, uh, hope you enjoyed our conversation with Corin Shadmi. We've got other great interviews lined up in the weeks to come, so keep your ears open for those. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya.